So welcome back. This is going to be screencast number two for chapter 20. And just to remind you, we are currently looking at arthropods. And in chapter 20, we are looking specifically at the subphylum crustacean. And so we're going to go ahead and look at various classes and orders in this second screencast. And so the first class we're going to focus on is one by the name of Branchiopoda. And this particular class has over 10,000 species, and those 10,000 species will fall into four specific orders. Now, the first order is one by the name of Anostraca. Now, this is going to include the fairy shrimp and a group called the brine shrimp. Now, some people may be familiar with brine shrimp and even fairy shrimp as well, because if you happen to be a person that keeps aquarium fish, oftentimes these animals are used as food for those fish. And over here on the right, you can look at the example B here. This is an example of a fairy shrimp. Um, this animal is one that does lack a carapace. So remember that a carapace is that sort of hard, um, kind of um, shell-like structure that you would find over typically the cephalothorax region of the animal, but occasionally it can also be found on the abdominal region as well. So in this order, these animals lack that carapace. Now the second order is Nodostraca, and this includes the tadpole shrimp. And in this case, the carapace is going to form a large dorsal shield. And you can see this in the example A here. And so right here, this is a tadpole shrimp. This is going to fall into this category of one that has a very large carapace. So order number three is going to be Concostraca, and this is going to include the clam shrimp. And their carapace is a bit unique because it's actually bivalved. In other words, we have an animal that actually has a hinged two-shelled carapace. And the fourth order is going to be the clad ocera, and this includes the water fleas. And in this case, the carapace is going to enclose the body, but it's not going to enclose the head. And you can see that over here on the right with this daphnia, which is an example of this order. So you can notice that the carapace is going to be located right through here, so it's going to cover this part of the body. But the head region of these animals is going to be free of that carapace. So when looking at the branchiopods, you're going to notice that their bodies do tend to be flattened. And these animals do tend to have what we consider leaf-like legs. And these legs can serve various functions. One of those functions is acting as a respiratory organ for the animal. Now the reason this is so incredibly efficient is because as these animals move these legs back and forth throughout the water, it brings them, of course, in very close contact with the oxygen in that water. So that ability to sort of force that O2 into the um, respiratory organs which are attached to those legs is much, much easier done when you have those structures moving back and forth. Now they're also going to assist in suspension feeding, which means they're going to grab onto small particles in the environment, and of course they're going to provide locomotion for a lot of these animals. Now most of these branchiopods are considered freshwater, but there are a few um, marine um, varieties as well. Now they are a very important part of what we consider freshwater zooplankton. Now plankton literally means just a very tiny animal that's going to drift throughout the environment and zo, of course, is going to refer to animal because we do have some plant-based plankton out there as well. Now the reproductive strategies of these branchiopods is actually really interesting because it's actually very similar to what you would have seen if we would have had a chance to study the rotifers earlier on in the year. Rotifers reproduce by parthenogenesis and so the branchiopods do exactly the same thing. Now what is parthenogenesis? Parthenogenesis is simply when you have an animal that will reproduce without the necessity of having a partner. So what that typically means is that the progeny or the offspring are going to be entirely of one sex. Now of course that um, particular gender is going to be female because of course the females will produce the young. Now one of the reasons why these animals would reproduce through parthenogenesis is to rapidly boost that population when conditions are favorable within the environment. And so typically this is going to happen in the spring and summer months. Now when things become unfavorable, like during the winter time or maybe the fall, then you will actually have these animals produce a few males which will mate with the females and when they produce eggs, those eggs are going to be able to withstand a lot of the harsh conditions during those um, seasons of the year. So in this case, the fertilized eggs are going to be very highly resistant to cold during this time. And this is going to be super critical for winter survival of that particular population. Now the next class we're going to look at is the class Maxillopoda, and we're going to look at the subclass Copapoda or the Copapods. 
Now these are actually third in number of species when compared to other classes. Now they do lack a carapace, but they do retain a very simple median nopolis single eye in the adult. Now they do have a single pair of uniramus maxillipeds, and I know maxilliped may not be quite familiar to you yet if you haven't started the um, crayfish dissection, but it's going to be appendage that you would find on these animals, and it's uniramus, which means it does not have that typical biramus arrangement. In other words, there are two um, parts that would extend from that single part of the appendage that you would see in, in various other appendages on that animal. So it's going to have a single pair of uniramus maxillipeds and actually four pairs of flattened biramus thoracic swimming appendages. And the antinuals, which is going to be probably one of two sets of antennae you would find in a lot of these animals, are going to be often longer than any of the other appendages you would find um, on the animal. And if you look down here in this center picture, you can definitely see how incredibly long these attenuals are in comparison to the other appendages you would find on the body of the animal. Now a really interesting thing when you're looking at copepods is they actually make up the most dominant primary consumer in most aquatic communities. Now what that means is this, if you remember back to your studies in biology, we had looked at a pyramid and on that pyramid at the very bottom you had a level that was called producers. And those producers were primarily the plants that you would find in that environment. Or if you're talking water, it might even be the algae. Now, right above the producers, you would have a first order, a first level consumer. And that's where these copepods are going to fall in these aquatic communities. Now, those copepods are going to feed on the producers in that environment. Now, typically, the next level above that would have been a second level or a second order consumer. Then, of course, at the very top of the pyramid would be your third level consumers. And so these copepods are actually the most dominant primary consumers in whatever aquatic community they happen to be found in. In other words, they basically provide a lot of food for those second and third level consumers. So they tend to be the most abundant organism in zooplankton by biomass, all right? With the producers making up the most biomass and those first level consumers making up the next most abundant amount of biomass. Now cyclops and diaptomus are very important elements of freshwater plankton. So those are two that are pretty important when it comes down to feeding those second and third level consumers. Now there are some free living copepods that are actually intermediate hosts. In other words, they hold on to various human parasitic tapeworms and nematodes. So again, a host is where you're going to find some of these parasites living and it's intermediate, so it's for a very short period of time. Now the development of copepods is going to be considered indirect. Now remember what that means is simply that they have various larval stages that don't look very similar to the final adult form. Now another subclass that we're going to look at is the subclass Cirripedia, and these include the barnacles. So these would be animals that you might find attached to rocks, as you see over here on the right. You could find them attached to ships or boats, and sometimes you can even find them attached to animals, for example, like whales. Now the adults in this case are considered sessile, which means they tend to stay relatively permanently attached to whatever substrate they happen to be on. And they can be either attached directly, like acorn barnacles, or they can be attached by a stalk, which would be an example of a goose barnacle. And down here towards the bottom right, you can see an example of that goose barnacle. You can see this stalk, which sometimes is referred to as the neck of the barnacle. Now the carapace is going to surround the body, and it's going to secrete a set of calcareous plates. All right. Now, these plates can be seen right here, pretty evident in this goose barnacle. Now, the head is going to be reduced, the abdomen is going to be primarily absent, and thoracic legs are going to be very long and with sort of hair-like CT, which is going to have a tactile function in the environment. Now, jointed cirri, remember those kind of very thin filament-like structures, are going to bear these CT and they're going to extend from the plates and they're going to be used to feed on very small particles in the environment. So it's very similar to the filter feeders that we had talked about in previous chapters. Now in barnacles, in intertidal zones, what you're going to find is they actually have plates that are going to be used to close the animal to the environment. And what they're going to do this for is to basically protect against what we call desiccation. And desiccation basically means to prevent the animal from drying out. So that's what those plates are going to be used for. 
Now these intertidal zones are going to be those areas that you would find where the tide will come in and the tide will come out. So of course if the tide goes out, those animals are going to be exposed and they run the risk of drying out. So again, those plates are going to be used to prevent that from happening. Now, when discussing most non-parasitic barnacles, we're talking about animals that are considered hermaphroditic, which simply means they, of course, again, have both male and female reproductive organs. And these animals will undergo metamorphosis during their development. Now, when they go undergo metamorphosis, you're going to notice that most will hatch as nopoli, and they become what we consider a cyprid or a non-feeding larvae with a bivalve carapace, so again it's bivalves, which means it actually has two parts, and they do have compound eyes. Now, as they continue to develop, they're going to attach to a substrate by their first antenna and adhesive glands to keep them secure. And then again, as they develop, they're going to secrete calcareous plates, those plates we had mentioned in the previous screen. They are going to lose their eyes because they're no longer needed, because they do tend to be sessile creatures and they're going to transform their swimming appendages to those filtering cirri that we had talked about before. Now the class Malacostraca is considered the largest and most diverse class of crustaceans and it's diverse because it contains over 20,000 different species and those 20,000 species are going to be found in three subclasses 14 orders and there's going to be a ton of suborders associated with this class. Now the first order we're going to look at is the order Isopoda. Now this is the only truly terrestrial crustacean that is out there. Now we say truly terrestrial because it does not need to go back to water for anything. It's truly a terrestrial animal. Now they also have both marine and freshwater forms that also fall into this category and those would be the ones that are considered aquatic. Now these animals are going to be dorsoventrally flattened, they do lack a carapace, and they do have compound eyes. Now when looking at these animals, you're going to notice the first pair of thoracic limbs are considered maxillipeds. And now again, with this term does not make sense to you because you haven't quite got to the crayfish dissection yet, it's totally fine. Um, it's just one of the many appendages you find on crustaceans. Now abdominal appendages do bear the gills, except for the uropods. And a uropod is going to be an appendage that's going to be found in the abdominal region, but these are not going to bear gills in these animals. Common landforms for these animals do include both the sow bugs, the pill bugs, also known as the roly polies, and that's what you're going to see over here on the right. Now, the cuticle in these animals is going to lack the protection often seen in the insect cuticle, and we haven't quite got to the insects yet. Now, because of this, most of these animals still need to have access to moisture, so they do tend to live in moist habitats. And what that means is you're going to find them under stumps, you're going to find them under rocks where things stay relatively moist. Some isopods are considered highly modified as parasites, and they're going to be parasites of fishes and possibly other crustaceans. And if you look over here on the right, you can just barely see the isopod that is right here. It kind of looks like the gill of the fish but it's actually a parasite of this animal. Now the development of these animals is typically direct, which means that the young that are produced look very similar to the adults, but it can be metamorphic in those that are considered parasites of other animals. Now the second order, Euphosiaceae, contains approximately 90 species, and these are the animals that are commonly called krill. So these are considered the ocean plankton. It's a very important group of animals. The carapace in these animals does not completely enclose the gills, and you can see this down here in the picture down below. This is the carapace of the animal, and you're going to notice the gills oftentimes will be extending out from under that carapace. Now they do lack maxillipeds, and again, don't worry about this term if you're not quite familiar with it yet. Again, you'll look at it with the crayfish. A lot of these animals are considered bioluminescent, which means they tend to glow at night, and the light-producing organ in these animals is called a photophore. Now they do form a major component of the diet of baleen whales and many filter feeding fishes. Now baleen refers to those um, plates that you would find in some whales. In other words, the whales that aren't necessarily carnivorous, in other words, they don't actually go after and attack their prey. They open their mouths really wide and those plates, those baleen, those filters open up really wide and what they do is they just basically filter the water as they swim through the environment. Now the eggs will hatch as nopoli, as we had talked about before, and for this particular group of animals, the development is considered direct, which means that the young are going to look very similar to the adults. 
Now, the very last order that we're going to look at is the order Decapoda. In fact, this is the order that you will be focusing on when you actually dissect your crayfish. Now, if you notice, I haven't really given you a lot of information on this order because a lot of what you're going to learn is going to be found in lab. But for this particular order, we do have a group of animals that has five pairs of walking legs and actually three pairs of maxillipeds. In crabs, the first pair of walking legs are going to form pincers. And you're going to see these pincers also, not only in crabs, but in the lobsters and the crayfish in lab. Now they're going to range from a few millimeters to the Japanese crab, which can have a leg span of about four meters. So approximately 18,000 species will be found in this order, and as I had said, this is going to contain the crayfishes, the lobsters, the crabs, and in fact, it's actually going to contain the true shrimp. Now we had sort of thrown that word shrimp around in the orders we had talked about previously, but this is the only order that contains the true shrimp. Now the crabs are sort of unique because they do have a much broader cephalothorax and a much reduced abdomen. So sometimes it's really hard to determine where the cephalothorax ends and the abdomen actually begins. Alright, so with that, that's going to finish up our second screencast for chapter 20. Please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide before you come to class.